This presentation is part two um, of our series on, on NGS library preparation theory and practice. And so in part one, um, we spent uh, some time answering the question of what are the objectives of, of, of library construction. Um, and we, just to summarize, basically concluded that on a, on a physical or a practical level, it's about fragmenting DNA and adding adapter sequences. And on a philosophical level, it's about you know, making that library that gives you the highest and most even coverage or, or number of overlapping unique fragments um, for every position that you're interested in sequencing. And so, and we concluded that part with looking at different ways of making libraries and the, the, the advantages and, and disadvantages of each of those. And so for the rest of um, this part, we're going to focus um, on ligation-based library construction. Um, and so we're going to, you know, just talk in general terms about that in, 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 in more detail and then look at key library construction parameters um, that can be optimized to, again, you know, help you make that best possible library from your available sample. And we'll, we'll um, end up this, this part of the, um, of the series with looking um, a little bit of in-process in um, QC and the value of doing some additional QC to help you, you know, initially optimize your method, but also gather valuable information for troubleshooting, you know, if things go wrong, which they, which they always do. And so let's look at library, con you know, ligation-based library construction in a little bit more detail. Um, so we, you know, we've talked about fragmentation in, in, in quite a bit of detail. Um, the core library construction process um, in the ligation-based um, library prep method um, consists of these three enzymatic steps. In repair, in which um, fragmented DNA is blunt-ended. Um, so any overhangs that was left by the fragmentation method, um, it's pulled in and then, you know, phosphorylated so that we create the you know, right chemical structure for um, double-stranded DNA-based ligation. Um, because Illumina adapters use a, have, have a T overhang, um, we A-tail the DNA fragments um, to facilitate the ligation process, make the ligation a little bit more efficient. Um, they are methodologies, so there are companies out there that use um, blunt-ended adapters. Um, if you do use blunt-ended ligation, then the A-tailing step obviously isn't necessary. Um, and then you know, the, third, the third, third part is that the actual ligation um, where we ligate this sort of Y-shaped um, or forked universal adapter um, to the random DNA, um, double-stranded DNA fragments um, using a, a DNA ligase, a double-stranded DNA ligase. Um, and the adapter in this, you know, in this step can either be a full-length adapter, so contain all the functional elements that we need for cluster amplification, sequencing, and multiplexing if needed, or it can be a truncated adapter or a, you know, a, a shorter adapter. Um, in which case we have to do library amplification to complete the adapter um, fragments. Library amplification is, is optional, as we said before. Um, if you have a full-length adapter and you end at the end of ligation with enough material to carry on with the next step, so that next step can either be sequencing or that can be target enrichment, so target capture before you go to sequencing, um, then you can simply stop here. Uh, if you don't have a full-length adapter or you need more material for the next step of the process, um, you would use library amplification, which is just standard PCR with primers, um, you know, based on the on the ends of your of your adapters, um, you know, whatever those ends look like at the at the, the pod to just make more duplicates of each one of your molecules. And so it, it's important to understand that you know these three processes have different um, roles in the in the overall library quality. So fragmentation, as we said, you know, whatever you're doing for fragmentation you need to use a, a, a method that's as unbiased as possible, so it doesn't break DNA in a sequence-specific manner. Um, and, in, you know, there's many choices there. In the end, um, you know, you want to use those, the, the, the method that's, you know, most convenient for you um, and, and, and create the, the, the highest quality of molecules. The core library construction process, um, this is the process that, that turns random DNA fragments into adapter ligated libraries. Um, though at, at the end of this process, whatever we haven't gotten adapters on are lost for the rest of the process. Um, and so the core library construction process is, is kind of the key of this whole methodology um, and the efficiency of this process, because this is the process that determines how many unique molecules you end up with. Um, and, and it becomes, you know, if, you, if you're using, you know, you start with a lot of DNA, it's not a challenging sample, it's less important. But you know, as we're trying to sequence from smaller and smaller quantities of DNA and from the more and more difficult samples, the efficiency of this core library pr um, um, construction process is, 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 is key in, in, in the whole process. I mean, PCR is it's important. Um, probably it's needed in some cases. But remember that PCR can only make duplicates. 
Um, we need duplicates because, you know, during the process of, of, of cluster amplification and sequencing, we lose a lot of DNA. So we're just kind of statistically making a lot more of everything to make sure that everything still gets represented at the requisite coverage. But, but it's important to understand that it's the core library construction process that, you know, determines in the end the, the, the diversity of the library and the, and the coverage, you know, the, the coverage depth that can be attained. Uh, library amplification affects coverage depth because if it's biased, um, you're going to be losing things and, and, and skewing the representation of, of molecules in the library. Um, and, but it's important to sort of distinguish these three um, stages of the process and optimize each of those individually. Um, when we look at the, at the library construction process from sort of a, a, a more practical angle, um, it's a little bit more complicated than just, just enzymatic steps. Um, and so there's sort of two types of, of ligation-based protocols out there. Um, broadly what we call conventional protocols and then streamlined protocols. Conventional protocols has a spry bead cleanup um, between each enzymatic fragmentation, of the, between enzy every enzymatic step. Um, so we're using paramagnetic beads basically in a, in a specific solution that allows us to bind um, DNA of certain fragments to the beads and then wash everything else away. And so the purpose of these spry cleanups is to you know, recover the DNA from every step and get rid of all the, you know, the, the buffer components and the enzymes um, so that you can start the next step with purified DNA in a, in a, you know, in a thrush buffer or in water um, and, and allows every enzymatic step to be as efficient as possible. Um, after ligation, um, many protocols use two spry bead cleanups. The ligation buffers, most ligation buffers contain a lot of um, PEG, polyethylene glycol, as a crowding reagent to um, facilitate uh, ligation efficiency. Um, and sometimes you need two, um, in most cases, you need uh, two spry beads you know, to efficiently get rid of the peg um, as that affects the, the, the length of DNA that bind to the beads and then do a proper cleanup after that. Um, so those are in conventional protocols, these are mandatory cleanups. You have to have them there. Um, and then you can also have some, you know, optional steps in there. So, you know, after fragmentation, depending on how you do it, you can build in a cleanup or a size selection at this point. Um, for instance, if you're fragmenting the, your DNA, um, in a, in a buffer that's not compatible with end repair or in a volume that's not compatible with the end repair reaction um, or, or you just want to kind of get rid of big and small molecules even before you start library construction, um, you can build an optional uh, 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 bead cleanup step in here. And then, you know, after ligation or after amplification, these are two places where, you know, we can also do size selection. So we've talked a lot about library fragment size, um, you know, the need to match your fragment size to your sequencing chemistry, your sequencer, your sequencing application, and your sample type. And then some, you know, for some applications, a very narrow size distribution is preferable, especially for de novo sequencing. Um, and so, you know, whenever you're making your, your population of molecules, um, you know, from, fra from fragmentation will give you a size distribution of molecules. It's not like a, you know, a single peak of, of, of sizes. Um, and so after ligation, you have a size distribution. And you know, in, in some applications, there's very good reason to narrow that size distribution and remove you know bigger and smaller molecules through a process of size selection. Um, then, if we just look at the, the efficiency of these protocols, um, you know, so it's, so one can get these conventional protocols are, are, are kind of long, but the the, the, um, the spry cleanups in between the steps make them very efficient. And so, if we just look at the at the cumulative recovery through these steps, so. NVP is a fairly efficient um, enzymatic process, um, and we can control the, 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 the losses through spry bead cleanups um, very well. And so if you do your spry cleanup properly, you know, after the NVP, you should have somewhere between, you know, 80 and 95 percent of your molecules. Of the molecules that you started with, you should have left at that point. Um, so fairly high recovery. And then A-tailing, again, is a fairly um, efficient process. The spry cleanup, after that, you can control the efficiency. Um, and so, at the end of it you, you 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 should prefer you know you should you should have the, the majority of the, the the unique molecules that you started with um, still available. Ligation is is traditionally seen as the most inefficient part of ligation-based library construction, um, which is partially true and partially not. Um, so, ligation itself, um, the, the purpose itself, the enzyme itself is not an inefficient enzyme. If you you know if you use it in the right at optimal concentrations in the right buffer conditions then ligation can be 100% efficient. Um, but ligation is input dependent. So it depends on the number of molecules in the reaction. If, if um, the number of molecules aren't limited, then you can get very high um, ligation efficiency. If the number of molecules, as they become more and more limiting, it's just the statistical probability of, you know, remember you have to do, you have to 
do two complete ligation events for every single DNA fragment. So you have to that, uh, ligate and adapt on both ends. And so your statistical, the statistical probability of you know, molecules just finding one another in, in, the, in the same, in the correct orientation um, decreases as input decreases. And so your, your final recovery, or what we call conversion, so the, the, the recovery through this entire process can be very, very low depending on you know, input, sample type, and the chemistry you use. Or it can be, for ligation-based method, get, gets to about 60%. That is, that's pretty much as good as you can get. Um, and so, you know, it, it's 60%, you know, obviously sounds good to everybody. You know, 1% sounds terrible to everybody. But that's the reality is, you know, when, you, when you're starting to work with very low inputs and chemistries that aren't well optimized. And so um, it, is, it is scary how much of your DNA you lose. And if you're starting with, you know, little or with challenging samples like FFPE from the beginning, it really means that, you know, to be able to get a usable library um, or as much sequence as possible from that library, it's important to, again, pick the best library construction strategy, the best chemistry, and carefully optimize every single parameter. If you're on sort of the easy end of library construction, then most of what, you know, we're going to discuss in the next hour is, is, is less important. So if we switch to streamline protocols, so as I said, these conventional protocols are, you know, they can be very, very efficient. Um, but they're very long, spry bead cleanups are terribly boring, um, very repetitive, you know, lots of things can go wrong, there's a lot of handling. And so, um, you know, obviously, for, especially for clinical applications, you know, um, shortening the time that it takes to do the library construction process, so for, for conventional protocols, five to six hours typically to get from fragmentation, from fragmented DNA, so that doesn't include the fragmentation, to an amplified library, you know, typically five to six hours. Um, that's just too long for, me, for many applications, especially if you still have to do target capture. So um, there's definitely been the, the, sort of the other development in library construction. So one development is trying to improve performance. The other sort of development is trying to improve speed and convenience and sort of bring ligation-based library protocols closer um, in terms of turnaround times and convenience to, for instance, segmentation and PCR-based protocols. So in streamlined protocols, typically what happens is um, the end repair and A-tailing reaction is combined into a single chemistry. So instead of having an enzyme and a buffer for end repair, then cleaning it up, and then an enzyme and a buffer for A-tailing, you have one enzyme buffer mix that does both of these reactions in one tube, and it's in sort of a, a sequential or a stepwise um, incubation. So you would first you know, mix your fragmented DNA with this end repair A-tailing buffer, then incubate at 20 to 30 degrees, depending on the kit you use um, in which, during which time um, end repair happens. Um, and then you know you raise the temperature to 65 or 70 degrees. That inactivates the end repair enzyme, and you know atailing happens at an elevated temperature. It's obviously very important to kill the end repair enzyme because if it's still active, you know as you're adding atails, it's just going to keep on end repairing them and bump ending them again, and you go sort of in a negative feedback loop. Um, but that's essentially how the how all streamlined kits sort of work. And so um, there's no need for the spray cleaning up between end repair and atailing. It also eliminates the spry bead cleanup between A-tailing and ligation. And so where you would go in repair, you know, clean up, you know, start from scratch, A-tailing, clean up, start from scratch. With the streamline protocol, all of this is additive. So, you know, you'll start with a 50 microliter um, of DNA, add 20 microliters, add or 10 microliters, add another 20 microliters. By the time you get to ligation, you have a pretty big reaction at this point. But the chemistries are designed to be additive. Um, then after ligation, you know, depending on the chemistry, um, and, and especially with the hyperprep kit, we've managed to um, eliminate one of the spry bead cleanups. So that uh, streamlines it even more. Um, in most cases, you don't have to do that. And then, you know, everything happens the same from that point onward. So after ligation, there's always going to be a cleanup step <clears throat> to get rid of unused adapter and adapter dimer. And then, you know, if your protocol requires library amplification, you'll go in with the purified adapter ligated DNA. Um, and then so there's always a final library cleanup before you, you, you have your final library. Um, with streamlined protocols, depending on how they design and, and the details of the kit you use, again, you have options to build in size selection and additional cleanups. Um, <clears throat> so you can do a, you know, you can, you can size select or clean your DNA after fragmentation if needed, or you can build in size selection after ligation or amplification. And we'll talk about size selection a little later in more detail. Um, if we look at, at streamlining versus performance, so this is kind of a, you know, a, a, it's, a, it's an interesting concept in evolution that we think of a lot, obviously, because, you know, Kappa employs evolution to, to in, evolve enzymes, really. Um, but we know that, that ev evolution is sort of divergent. So if you, you know, if you focus on one aspect of something, you kind of lose the other one if you don't, um, if you don't specifically select for it or focus on it. 
And so, you know, streamlining typically comes at a cost to performance. Um, and, and this is what we saw. So when we started building our streamlined kit, which is the hyperpress kit, um, you know, this control is, was a con is our conventional protocol. We call it our speed protocol. We, we just took the cleanups out of that control. So if we're looking at conversion, that's the percentage of DNA that's converted to adapter ligated library in that core library construction process, um, it dropped significantly. Um, and so, you know, what we had gained by optimizing that protocol very well, we just lost, you know, we lost almost all of it by just taking the cleanup steps out. And so we really had to work on the chemistry to make sure once I see those chemistries are additive, we don't lose the performance advantage. We don't lose that ability to recover adapter ligated molecules. And so that we, you know, able to, to evolve protocols that are both, you know, rapid and convenient, but still retain all the performance advantages that we had in the in, in the previous versions. And so this is just, you know, showing another one of the competitors, Streamline is just showing again that, you know, it, streamline chemistry, streamlining is obviously from a from a workflow perspective and a convenience perspective, um, is very attractive. But be very careful when you select, um, you know, a streamlined kit to make sure that you select a chemistry that that does perform equally well or better than the, the conventional protocols where the steps were individually optimized. Um, and hopefully, in this, you know, towards the end of this presentation, you know, it, you'll you'll have some tools on on how to answer this question of of how good is the chemistry that I've I've selected for my um, library construction. So if we just look at sort of cumulative recovery, obviously we see this library construction process um, not as individual steps in streamlined protocols, but as a single step. Um, and recovery, again, you know, uh, depends on sample type input. But especially with the Hyper, uh, the hyper Plus protocol, where we're able to even add um, the enzymatic fragmentation in the same tube, and we'll talk about that in huge detail in the next um, part of the series, uh, we are able at high inputs to, to get to about 100% recovery. So if you start with a microgram of DNA, you can get more of a microgram of DNA out. That's not possible, you know, at the low end of things, but the, the, the improvements to the chemistry and the streamlining has allowed us to, to lift at this bottom end, so the really challenging end of library construction, you know, to the to 10, 5 to 10% range, which is, you know, previously unheard heard of. And, and what when we started off with library construction is what we would achieve with, you know, a 1,000 times more DNA. And so, again, there's a lot of, you know, different protocols out there. Even within ligation-based library preparation, there's a lot of different kits, um, lots of different protocols, lots of different vendors. How do I, you know, pick the one that makes the most sense? Um, and, you know, if I have challenging samples and, and low inputs, what else can I do to make sure that, you know, I get the best possible library? It may or not be a perfect library in each case, but that should always be the aim. When I make this library, and especially if I only have one chance at it, how do I make the best, best possible library I could have made from that sample? And so there's a bunch of things that, that can be considered, and we're going to go through each one of these. So just looking very briefly at enzyme properties and formulation, DNA input and quality, fragmentation and fragment length, adapter concentration, cleanups and size selection, and then talk a little bit about library um, amplification. And so a combination of you know good strategy, good chemistry, and well-optimized parameters, that essentially um, you know, allows you to make the best possible library from your sample. And so let's start off um, with enzyme properties and formulation. Um, so there, there's obviously a, a few companies out there that sell library construction reagents. Most reputable companies sell really good enzymes um, of really high quality. Um, the enzymes for end repair, atailing, and ligation aren't that differentiated um, between companies. So, <clears throat> you know, there's only so many chemistry combinations that work. And so it's, you know, and as you read in the literature a little bit more, pretty much everybody uses the same sort of enzymes. But the formulations definitely differ. So enzyme concentrations differ, enzyme purity differs a little bit. Um, there are situations where, um, you know, some, some um, kits would provide all the, the components separately. So you would have, you know, one or two enzymes, a buffer, magnesium chloride, and some nucleotides. Um, these are all sort of supplied as individual components to go into a reaction. That's sort of pretty much being phased out now, but there's still some of those kits around. Um, a sort of improvement on that was supplying one enzyme mix and one buffer, so at least you only have two components to pipette for every reaction. And then there's some companies that just pre-mix everything for you, so you have you know a master mix for each. Um, this is obviously more convenient again, but beware that master mixes are less stable than um, individual formulations. 
Um, and so, you know, whenever you, you select a kit, um, obviously convenience is a great thing, but look at the shelf life on the kit um, and, and, and obviously select the kit that will give you the, the, the longest shelf life. In other words, if you buy the kit that you have the best chance that, you know, when you use the kit today and six months later that, it's, that you're going to get the same performance out of it. Um, also, formulations for, for conventional and streamlined protocols differ, so, you know, don't mix and match things between kits like you may not be able to use the ligation buffer from a streamlined kit. Well, you probably can't use the ligation buffer from a streamlined kit in a conventional protocol and vice versa. Um, but especially with streamlined protocols, when you evaluate those, um, make sure to look at performance because some of those are, you know, they're well formulated and work very, you know, a, a guaranteed performance, whereas some of them, um, some of them just, you lose a lot of performance at the, you know, for, for the convenience and the speed. Um, then what's very important is that amplification enzymes are definitely not the same. Um, and so we ATLing ligation and um, enzymes for NGP ATLing ligation are pretty much similar between kids. Amplification enzymes are not the same. Um, amplification bias has a huge impact. So, you know, we all know that, that PCR is not perfect, um, that PCR enzymes battle with, you know, AC rich and GC rich molecules. And it's less important when we do traditional PCR. So for instance, you know, in the old days when we all learned to do PCR, the focus was mostly on amplifying a single thing. So we wanted to get, you know, a 500 base pair fragment of the gap DH gene or something. And we could carefully optimize primer sequences and everything else to get the most out of our enzyme for that specific, you know, target. But remember that libraries are, are mixed populations of molecules. And so in the same tube, you have to have an enzyme that efficiently amplifies long stuff and short stuff, GC rich stuff and AT rich stuff, stuff with complicated secondary structure and not all at the same efficiency because whatever you had at the end of ligation, so your, 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 your population of unique fragments, you want to just copy all of that to the same, to the same um, extent so that you, can, you, you, you retain your coverage uniformity basically. During the PCR step, if you use an enzyme, enzymes that are less biased will preferentially amplify the easy molecules, so the short ones and the, the ones with balanced GC content. Um, and, and that's where, the, where the, the population starts being skewed, and this is where your, your issues with coverage uniformity starts. Then fidelity is important. Everybody uses high fidelity enzymes for library amplification because we are you know, sequencing individual fragments, not, not single molecules, but individual fragments, you know, the clonal populations of these individual fragments. Um, fidelity is, is, is less of an issue in the context of library. Um, amplification, but just remember that we you know, don't want to go amplify libraries with tech and introduce a whole bunch of substitutions and, 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 and errors using a library amplification reaction. And so on the, on the point of, 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 of enzymes, I just wanted to show you, make you aware of this. So <clears throat> in 2012, beginning of 2012, um, Mike Quayle's group at the Sanger Welcome Trust um, in, in the UK, Cambridge in the UK, um, wrote, published a paper in Nature. So they looked at you know, enzymes that were available and can be used for library construction, and they compared them all in terms of amplification bias, and identified kappa hi-fi, so this is an enzyme that we made through a process of, of directed evolution, um, identified it as the best enzyme for NGS library amplification specifically because of its ability to not only amplify DNA with high fidelity and really high efficiency, but with very, very low bias. And so this is just two um, this is just two data plots, um, coverage plots again from that paper, and again working with these, um, you know, model microbes with different GC content. So Bordetella is one that I showed you in the previous uh, part, in, in part one, um, when we looked at the GC bias plots. P. falciparum um, is, the, is the malaria parasite, so extremely difficult to work with and very, very low GC content. Um, and again, so we're looking at the percentage of the genome covered against normalized depth. So again, you know, the, the, the depth of, of any one um, fraction of the genome compared to the average. Um, and so if everything was perfect, again, if library construction and amplification and plus amplification and sequencing was perfect, you would get a size distribution that, that looked, a, a, a coverage distribution that looked like this. Um, and let's, let's flip to the one on the right-hand side first. So what you're seeing um, here in the blue is, is fusion. That's an enzyme that was used very extensively in NGS library construction, you know, from day one and, and still today in some kits. Um, we have HIFI, which is the kappa enzyme, the in engineered kappa enzyme um, in purple, and then we have a no PCR. So, so this is basically the bias that you see there is just imposed by cluster amplification and sequencing, that those libraries weren't amplified at all. And so you, can't, you see that it's not perfect, and it's because, you know, the cl cluster amplification and sequencing aren't perfect. 
Um, but the, 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 the pro profile, so the coverage profile for the Kappa Hi-Fi enzyme, a lot closer to the no PCR and fusion. So you can see with fusion, there's a, there's a whole lot of the genome that's underrepresented and overrepresented um, because of its bias characteristics. And then when we go to the, the G-series organism, the, the, the coverage uniformity plots, uh, you can see the, the pink lines and the, and the, and the gray line uh, and, the, and the, purple, the purple and the green line. So the no PCR and the, the Hi-Fi superimpose exactly, which basically says that amplification with the Hi-Fi enzyme imposes no bias, no, no detectable bias um, on these libraries. And so again, you know, amplification, if you're going to do it, and in, in most library construction protocols you have to do it, pick that the enzyme with the best bias characteristics. So this brings us to the second sort of parameter, um, DNA input and quality. Um, and the question to, to ask here is, is, how much DNA do you need for library construction? Um, the first place to start answering that question is, what is your coverage depth? Um, and so for instance, if you're doing whole genome sequencing and you need every base covered at 30x, then at least you need to sequence 30 unique molecules. You know, 30, you, you, at least have 30 unique overlapping, um, you know, fragments for, for, for each, each position, which means you have to start with at least 30 copies <laughs> of your genome. In reality, you need thousands and thousands fold more than that because you lose DNA during fragmentation, you lose DNA during the core library construction process, you lose a lot of DNA during cluster amplification, um, and, uh, yeah, and then the sequencing reaction is not perfect either. So the coverage depth is, you know, maybe sort of a place to start, but in reality, you need a hell of a lot more than you know, what your average coverage, co coverage depth means. Um, next question is how many copies do I actually have? And so, um, you know, having some kind of a sense, obviously if you have, you know, a high, uh, a high complexity genomic sample um, versus a low complexity or low molecular weight DNA, you know, for a certain amount of nanograms, um, you know, high complexity DNA, you have fewer copies than you have in lower complexity DNA. I always try and keep this table in mind, so I kind of use the human uh, genome as a reference. Um, it's about 3.3 times 10 to the 9 base pairs. And so, you know, in 100 nanograms, we have 30,000 copies. And a nanogram, we have 300, and a microgram, we have 300,000. We just compare that with E. coli. So the E. coli um, genome is about 1,000, so like 720 times smaller um, in the total number of base pairs. And so for 100 nanograms of, of um, E. coli DNA, we have a lot more copies. And so what it says, um, you know, for, for when we have lower complexity DNA, we maybe don't need that many nanograms of DNA. We can start with much less. Um, but it, 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 it is also de dependent on, you know, the, the, the properties of ligation. So just because we have more or less the same number of copies here um, than we have here doesn't mean that this is equivalent in terms of input for library construction because ligation gets less and less efficient as the copy number drops. Other thing to remember is that DNA quality affects copy numbers. So for instance, if you have FFPE DNA, you may have, you know, 100 nanograms of FFPE DNA and think there's 30,000 copies. But because of the, the, the damage in, in the FFPE DNA, so some of the DNA can't be N repaired, some of it can't be ATL, some of it can't be ligated, a lot of it can't be amplified. <clears throat> And so the effective copy number depends on the quality of the DNA. The lower the quality, um, the fewer copies you're going to have for the nanograms you have. And I don't, I didn't, don't have time to go into this in detail, but Kappa has a kit, a qPCR-based kit. It's called the Kappa Human Genomic um, DNA Quantification and QC kit. And it's a qPCR-based kit that allows us not only to quantify, um, this is only for human genomic DNA, but allows us to quantify very dilute um, solutions of, of, of human genomic DNA by qPCR but also gives us an info, some information on the quality of the DNA um, upon which we can make these decisions about um, input, uh, the amount of input that's required for successful library construction. And so this is just the tables. Um, all of our library construction kits have these tables in. Um, and, and you'll see that the these way Kappa kits are a little different to kits from maybe under other vendors. Most other protocols says, you know, start library construction with so many nanograms of DNA. Um, with our kits, it's basically, you know, it's, it's variable depending on the application, the sample type, uh, you know, the, 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 the sequencing application, you can, you know, start with a different number of copies. And, and you need to start with, you know, more if your DNA is more complex or damaged um, and a little less for, for, for other applications. And so for whole genome sequencing, for instance, you know, you can, make a, you can make a library that everything really has to be perfect if you want to make a library from 50 nanograms of human genomic DNA. Um, for whole genome sequencing, a microgram is much better. 
just because you have a lot more and you have a lot more room for error. Um, but these are the ranges that that's possible. You know, below 50 nanograms, you're going to end up having a really hard time breaking time to make a library that you can maintain. You know, that you can achieve 30x coverage uniformly across the you know every single base. Um, for target capture and custom panels, because you're, you're interrogating a smaller sequence space, you can get away with a little less. Um, the upper limit is just determined by the chemistry, so you can go up to a microgram with the hyper, hyper plus kit. Um, for FFP DNA, um, you know, a microgram is the upper limit, but nobody ever has a microgram. And so basically for FFP DNA, most people are working between 50 and 250 nanograms. Uh, it's very quality dependent, so if your, your FFP quality is good, you have a good chance of making a library from 50 nanograms of DNA. If it's poor, you, you will probably need 250 nanograms um, minimally to make an acceptable library. Whole genome sequencing, you know, for microbial depends very much on the genome size. Um, and then, you know, we, we can keep on going. Amplicons, obviously, very low complexity um, DNA. And so anything more than a nanogram is good enough. Um, and then for certain RNA-seq applications, um, so RNA-seq is a completely different library construction um, paradigm. Um, in most cases, you first fragment your RNA, then make double-stranded cDNA. Um, but in cases, there are also um, protocols where you make full in cDNA, and then you just treat that cDNA like DNA. So you'll fragment it to NDPA ligation. ligation. Um, and then for RNA, again, because the complexity of the species is a lot uh, lower, you can use, you can start with a lot less and, and be successful. Um, a little caveat here, and we'll talk about size selection. When you have to do size selection for your application, you do lose a lot of DNA. And you have to take that into account when you, you know, decide how much input DNA you need to use. Third parameter that we can you know, look at and, and make sure that we optimize properly, and we've talked a lot about this in, in part one of this series, is, is DNA fragmentation and fragment length. And so the critical question for any, any time that you need to make a library is, how do I fragment the DNA and to what, what length do I need to fragment it? Um, so we said before, the optimal fragment length is determined by your sequencer. Your sequencing application, you know, your your, your chemistry um, and your your sample type. So, for instance, on a MySeq, you can go as much as two by three hundred base pair sequencing, um, and it depends whether you know your sample will support that and whether it makes sense in terms of your application. Whether you want to go, you know, make a library with a three hundred fifty base pair insert or a hundred and fifty base pair insert. The difference being no overlap in the model or full overlap um, or anything in between. Um, de novo sequencing, sequencing versus resequencing or targeted sequencing. So for de novo, <clears throat> you typically, you know, if you have no scaffold, if you have nothing to align your sequence to, and you have to build it from scratch, the longer, the better. Um, remembering that there are limitations in terms of cluster amplification and sequencing chemistry, um, but also for de novo sequencing, where you're building, you know, um, where you're building sequences de novo without any help, um, having, you know, well-defined or narrow size distributions is more valuable than having, you know, because especially with you know, microbes, it's very easy to get very, very high coverage um, because it, in a lot of cases, if you, unlike in, if you don't have environmental samples, if you have cultured samples, DNA input's not limiting. And so you can start library construction with as much as you, you know, can get and then, you know, reduce size selection. During the size selection process, you lose a lot, but it definitely has advantages for what comes later. Um, targeted sequencing, it depends on the probe system that you're using. So you know some hybridization probe systems are optimized for fragments around 150 to 250 base pair. Other hybridization systems are optimized for slightly longer fragments. So there again, your fragment length is determined by the by the you know the process that comes after library construction. And then high, high, high quality versus damaged DNA. We talked about it that a little earlier. FFTE DNA, for instance, you know the damage is molecular damage is of such a nature that um, you know. Although we can fragment DNA into large pieces, we can't utilize large pieces um, through any of the amplification steps of the process. And so rather fragment your DNA short to have a better statistical ability of getting as many unique fragments into your, into your sequencing run in the end, sequenceable in the end. Um, so that's fragment length, you know, fragmentation methods. We've spoken about that. Essentially, we have, you know, mechanical shearing, which is the Kovaris. Um, there are other things like bioruptors and nebulizers, um, but the Kovaris is, is by far the most widely, widely used mechanical um, shearing methodology. Um, it's very random. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a pain. So, it, you know, it requires expensive equipment and expensive consumables. It's time consuming, but it is the most random fragmentation method out there. Um, 
some of the enzymatic fragmentation methods, um, we, we talked about are, are more convenient, um, they're faster to do, they're easier to scale, uh, they don't need uh, uh, sophisticated equipment or expensive consumables, but you know, fragmentation, enzymatic fragmentation, and that I include fragmentation as it also uses an enzyme method, um, not, as, not as good control over fragment length, uh, more bias, issues with bias, um, and, and as I said previously, we, we're very happy that with the, the latest of fragmentation, so the cap of frag kit that we've just released, um, we believe address the issues, the traditional um, setbacks of enzymatic fragmentation. Um, highest recovery, so this is an important point, it's kind of a hidden one. Um, you know, when you fragment in, in Covarus tubes, it is sometimes difficult to recover, you know, samples out of those tubes, especially when you have, you know, very little to start off with. Um, so, you know, whatever you're doing, make sure that you, you, you use a process that allows you to recover as much DNA as possible. Uh, with Covaris, for instance, you have the option uh, to shear in like a 50 microliter volume or a, a 130 microliter volume. It's, it's easier to do the 130, it's easier to recover it, um, you know, but sometimes you have to do a cleanup or a concentration step and so then it becomes counterproductive again. So there's a lot of different things, you know, to be weighed. And then throughput's important. So, you know, everybody's doing more and more and more sequencing, and so when you pick a method, um, performance characteristics are always, you know, performance is always more important than convenience, um, but, you know, if the reality is that you have to make a thousand libraries and it's just you and you don't have a robot, um, then, you know, you, 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 you want to pick a method that best suits um, your throughput and your ability to process samples in a, in a manner that's consistent. So if you, you know, if you only have to make eight libraries, it's very easy to do those, like a virus, be very meticulous, but if you have a thousand libraries to make, you know, you're going to see a lot more um, sample to sample variation between those just because, you know, it's a lot of handling and a lot of um, possible um, uh, variation is a lot, as a result just of handling steps. Um, and so th th that's another thing that's great about the, the Hyper Plus kit where the enzymatic fragmentation happens in the same tube as library construction. So there's just, you're basically not losing anything. So apart from the fact that you're now able to use enzymatic fragmentation to get unbiased fragmentation, um, gives you nice control of its over fragment length, you don't lose anything because you're carrying on with the DNA in the same tube. And this is why we've seen higher library construction efficiencies with the Hyper Plus kit, even when we compare it with Covara Sharing Plus Hyper Prep, which is the, the, the same library construction method. Okay, so this brings us to the next one, which is um, adapter concentration. Um, now, you know, adapter concentration again in, in a lot of protocols are is fixed. If input is fixed, it's like you know, if you're going to always start library construction with 100 nanograms or a microgram, just use you know the same adapter concentration. Again, because you know we allow you and we support um, different inputs for different applications and sample types with our kits. Um, adapter concentration is important. <clears throat> and those of you can most appreciate it. Probably, I don't know how many of people in the audience have, have done cloning in the past. So, you know, ligating adapters is a little bit the same as cloning. Um, and you'll remember, if you've done it, you know, that your, your, when you, you're trying to make, you know, clone an insert into a plasma, your, your insert, your plasma, the ratio is important. And so you always have, want to have an excess of the one to ensure, you know, the best statistical probability of getting that insert into the plasma. And the same, the same goes for adapters. Um, and so, it's not that, you know, the concentration per se of the adapter that's important, but it's the molar ratio between the adapters and the insert that's important. Um, that molar ratio is um, affected by fragment length. So again, if you have 100 nanograms of insert, um, if that insert is 500 base pairs, you're going to have fewer copies than when the insert is 200 base pairs, and that affects the adapter insert molar ratio. So although, you know, in our protocols we give concentration, we, we think in terms of molar ratio. And when you get to a molar ratio of less than 3 to 1, I mean, we've done these experiments, most of your fragments end up with a single adapter. That's of absolutely no use to you because you have to have an adapter on both ends to do, you know, library amplification and cluster amplification. Um, and so you need to use an excess of adapter to achieve the highest ligation efficiency. And the lower your input, the more adapter you use, the, 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 you, can, you can sort of push the efficiency of the ligation reaction by using more and more adapter. Um, there are limits to it, though. And it depends on the chemistry. So, you know, because you're using an excess of adapter, the adapter itself can, you know, it can ligate to itself, even though it has a T overhang and it's not compatible with the T overhang of, of, you know, the, 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 the another adapter. It is possible to ligate adapters together. And because we use high molar excesses of adapter, 
we do get a lot of adaptive diver formation, and it's it's worse with worse with conventional kits than it is with streamlined kits typically. Um, and so the the type of chemistry that you use ultimately determines determines the amount of adapter that you can use, and it determines to what effect you can push the efficiency of ligation for low input applications. And I have one data slide that that will explain that in a more in more of detail. And then what's also important because we use a lot of adapter to try and make um, ligation as efficient as possible, it means we have to clean it out. There will be unused adapter and there will be adapter dimer, and so it affects the rest of our library construction process in the sense that we just need to make sure that we clean up the adapter properly. Um, you know, some protocols and things out there go the other way. You know, when you have a problem, it, it's, it's very important to get rid of adapter adapters and adapter dimers because they can adapter dimers specifically will amplify very efficiently and they might take over a library amplification reaction. They cluster very efficiently, so they take up real estate on your flow cell. Um, so it's really important to get rid of them. Um, but, but reducing the adapter concentration to the point where they don't form is not the right way of doing it because you're, you're reducing your library construction efficiency. Um, the best strategy is to use you know, a, a, a reasonable and the highest adapter insert molar ratio that your chemistry allows you, but then do your cleanups properly. And so this is a really interesting experiment that we kind of did by accident one day, and I wanted to show you just the trends. So this was done with a conventional protocol. This is not the HyperPrep or the HyperPlus protocol. So it's still the three-step protocol, um, but it's a little irrelevant um, in, in the context of the larger discussion. And so we did library construction. These are all done in duplicates. This is all the same DNA, um, but then doing library construction with 500 nanograms, 250, 100, all the way down to 100 picograms of input. This was all human genomics. So at this point, we have like three copies. And at this point, we have almost 150,000 copies, if I remember correctly. And so the, the whole idea was not to try and sequence them, it's just to see what happens with the library yields and, and adapted dimer as we increase the adapter insert molar ratio. So we sort of kept it the same um, for the higher inputs up to 100 nanograms, and then we kept the, the we just kept the adapter, so we kept the ratio the same, which means that the concentration of the adapter used for the 200 nanograms, 250 nanograms was half than the concentration used here, and the concentration of the adapter stock for 100 nanograms was two and a half times less. But then we just kept the concentration the same, which means that the molar ratio increased and increased as the input dropped, as the amount of uh, library molecules dropped. Um, and so what you can see is, is as, as the adapter insert molar ratio kind of increases, and this is a jolt, it's not fully quantitative, but you do get an increase in, in, in library yield. Um, and then at some point, and, and with the conventional chemistry, it's around about somewhere between 50 to 100 to 100 to 1. Um, then you just then library construction just becomes very very efficient and you preferentially just get adapters you know you, you start getting very small molecules ligated a, a huge increase in adapter dimer and eventually you just get adapter dimer and so they definitely is an optimal you just can't keep on adding adapter that optimal as I said for conventional kits is probably around 50 to 100 to one for the hyperprep chemistry it's a lot higher um, and this is what I'll show you on the next slide so. One of the advantages of the higher prep chemistry, the cumulative and streamlined chemistry that we developed, is that it inhibits adapter dimer formation. And so not only allows, that allows us to drop the second cleanup of the ligation, which streamlines the protocol a lot more, but it allows us to use much higher adapter insert molar ratios. And so this is data for, um, you know, for libraries made from cell-free DNA, free circulating DNA. Um, it's, it's hard to isolate this DNA from plasma. It's very hard to isolate. And you're lucky if you get 10 nanograms. You're really lucky if you can get that much. And so typically people are trying to make libraries from you know, around a nanogram to two nanograms. Um, and so in this experiment, um, what, what they did was compare the hyperprep chemistry with the conventional. So this is the kappa high throughput uh, with bead protocol, um, essentially, which is a really well optimized conventional protocol. Um, and so looking at, at different, you know, at the same input two nanograms or 10 nanograms at different adapter insert molar ratios. And you can see with the conventional chemistry, as you increase the, the ratio of adapters, so more adapter per library fragment, you're definitely getting an, you get an increase in yield, which I didn't show you, but you can also get a huge increase in, in adapter dimer. So this is, in the end, reads that just map to adapter dimer. And obviously, those reads you can't use, they take away from your sequencing capacity and they reduce the, the, your, your coverage for useful molecules in the end. With the hyperprep chemistry, um, you, you, you can go up to 1,000 to 1, so at 300 to 1, yeah, you just basically can't, you know, you, over 25% of your reads end up being adapters. It's not possible, um, essentially. But with the kappa hyperprep chemistry, you know, even at 1,000 to 1, you have very, this is about 2% of the reads. 
Um, and so that's, that's Archimedes uh, specifically was the hyper prep um, kit with Kovari sharing or the hyper plus kit with um, enzymatic sharing, either of those because the library construction chemistry inhibits adapter dimer formation really allows us to use adapter concentration as a tool to achieve the highest uh, possible library construction efficiency, especially for low inputs and difficult samples. And so in the hyperplus and the hyperprep chemistry, there's, a, there's basically a table and it, you know, for your different inputs and you'll see what we do is up to 50 nanograms, we keep the concentration of the, the stock the same. Um, at, at, and so the adapter insert molar ratio increases from 10 to 1 at a really high input um, to 200 to 1 at about 50 nanograms. And then we just keep that standard um, all the way down to a nanogram. Um, the, the 10 to 1 year is not optimal. If you were to increase this to 20 to 1 or 40 to 1, you'll get even higher yields. But at high inputs, you know, ligation itself is already more efficient. And so this 10 to 1 molar ratio is a good compromise between cost and, and efficiency. You can push that by increasing it. And then at the lower inputs, you, by this time, you're diluting your adapter you know, stock so much that your adapter cost starts becoming you know, less and less, even though you're using high insert, um, adapter insert molar ratios. And then for really low inputs, we, we typically you know, encourage people to say, try the 200 to 1, but try something like 3 or 400 to 1 and 4 to 800 to 1. Just try a few higher ratios, go all the way to 1,000, and just see if there's any benefit um, for your specific sample and application by using higher um, adapter insert molar ratios. Number five, cleanups and size selection. Um, so as we discussed before in conventional protocols, um, the reaction product of every enzymatic step um, is purified for the next step, and it's, 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 it's critical. So with conventional protocols, you can't add the A-tailing you know, buffer and enzyme to the end repair reaction. Those enzymes don't like being in the same tube, and it makes everything really inefficient. Um, so there has to be, in conventional protocols, there has to be a cleanup between every enzymatic step. Um, the older protocols used columns, um, and these are pretty much the same sort of columns as used for PCR purifications and cleanups. Um, and this is pretty much all used, um, moved to bead-based cleanups now, and it's just because beads are easier to use and they're easier to automate. You, it's, it's very hard, probably impossible, um, on, on most sort of off-the-shelf uh, liquid handling systems to use columns. And so everything is kind of used to using spry beads or you know, ampere XP reagent that, that's um, provided by, by Beckman Coulter. Um, with the streamlined chemistries, obviously, um, they're designed to be additive, so you don't have to do any cleanup after. Independent eye tailings one reaction anyway, no cleanup before ligation, and so um, with the streamline protocols, your first cleanup is after ligation, and then you have one after amplification. That's just part of the, you know, the, the streamlining and the efficiency of these protocols. Um, it's part of the higher recovery is just because there's so so much less handling steps involved there. Another concept that's important to understand is what <coughs> is basically the difference between a cleanup and a size selection. Um, and this is all bead based now. Some people talk about a single-sided single spry or a double-sided spry. And so this is essentially the difference. With a single-sided spry, um, the only thing that you will exclude um, in, during that cleanup or the single-sided spry is small things. And depending on the ratio, the spry ratio, and we'll talk about that just now, um, that depends what you exclude. So for instance, if you, use, if you do like a, a 2x spry cleanup, which means that the volume of your ampule that you're adding to the volume of your DNA is twice. So if you have your DNA in 50 microliters, you're adding 100 microliters of ampule that gives you a 2x cleanup. Um, at that point, you're, you're only excluding really, really small things, maybe less than, than 50%. And that kind of cleanup, the high ratio cleanups, are designed for really high recovery and not really to exclude any sizes. Um, and then as your ratio decreases, so by the time you get to like a 1x cleanup, you'll be excluding things up to like, you know, 120-ish base pairs, which is just about the size of an adapter dimer. A double-sided spry is designed to cut big things and small things away. So what we have in the red here is, is, is basically an amplified library. This is um, made from DNA shear to around about 250 base pairs. So after adding adapters, you're, you're around 370, 400 base pairs. Um, and you can see the effect of a double-sided spry. So it's designed, and we'll go through the process in detail now, to exclude large things and small things, and that's why it's called a double-sided spry. Um, and so double-sided spries, you always lose a lot of material. Um, that depends on, you know, what you lose depends on what you're trying to exclude. So, you know, it's, it's always important to make sure that the peak of your, your, your non-size selected library matches the peak of what you want as closely as possible. 
I mean, if your if your library kind of looks like this, and you were doing your size selection around here, you would lose a lot more material. Um, so, so you're losing material because you're excluding it on purpose, but you're also losing material because it doesn't matter how you do size selection, whether you do it with um, beads or lots of people are using gels um, or electrophoretic devices like there's a thing called a Pippin Prep, Pippin Almond has a thing called a, a, a Lab a Chip GX. Doesn't matter how you do it. All of all of those um, techniques are have inefficiency in terms of DNA recovery. Um, so the point here is, is think very carefully about cleanups versus size selection and the relative value of a of a size selection um, and whether that loss of material is really worth it. So talking a little bit more about uh, this agent called Ampure um, Xperia agent, that's basically spry beads. So this is provided by Beckman Coulter. It's spry beads, which are paramagnetic beads, basically in a pig sodium chloride con um, solution. And we talked about kind of spray ratios. Um, it, it, it's, it's not the bead themselves, but it's the ratio, the, the concentrate, in other words, the final concentration of the pig sodium chloride solution that determines which DNA fragment lengths bind on the beads and which ones aren't bound, in, in other words, are going to be washed away. And your, your spray ratio is basically just your volume of ampule versus the volume in which your DNA is, is, is present. Um, and so the larger the ratio, the better recovery, but less exclusion. Um, and what's important to understand, and I'll, I'll show you a graph just now that makes this a little less abstract, but the chemical composition of your DNA and the nature of the DNA can affect the binding. So um, for instance, so, so, so most of the spray ratios and the cutoff ratios are determined in you know, an aqueous solution like um, 10 millimolar tris or water. Um, if you, your, your DNA is in a solution that contains a lot of pig or, pig or a lot of salt, it's going to affect the sizes that bind to the, to the beads. And so, for instance, especially after ligation, um, I mentioned previously all ligation buffers have a lot of pig in there. It's a crowding reagent to facilitate the efficiency of ligation. It yeah, um, brings molecules closer together, basically. Um, and so one has to understand that whatever, you know, if you're using the same spray ratio in a ligation reaction product versus purified DNA, it's going to affect the, the sizes of the DNA that binds to the beads. Um, some of the stuff's well worked out, so you don't have to worry about it so much. We provide good instructions for what to do. And then also, for instance, double standard DNA versus partially single standard DNA um, bind a little differently to spray beads. So again, in terms of practice, we, we provide good, um, we, we provide really good instructions, but just understand that you know spray bead cleanups aren't they aren't fixed things. There's a lot of variables that ter that determine what's excluded, what binds to the beads, and the, you know, the efficiency and the recovery out of a spry, um, spry cleanup. And so this is the graph I, that I wanted to show you. Um, so what we have here is the volume of spry, so the, the ratio of the spry um, versus the DNA. So at a, at a 1x ratio would mean you would be adding 50 microliters of ampure reagent to 50 microliters of DNA. Um, and then this is the minimum fragment size that's retained. Okay. So first we look at this red curve, which is when DNA is in crisp buffer or in water. Um, and this would be, you know, for instance, if you were to do a size selection right after your um, fragmentation reaction, um, your, your DNA would be kind of in water or, a, a, you know, a T buffer, low T buffer or something like that. <clears throat> and if you did a 1x spray cleanup at that point, then you would be retaining, so, so it, it, you would be retaining a, everything bigger than, say, 120-ish base pairs will be bound to the beads, and so when you wash the beads, you'll wash all the small stuff away. Um, and that's, that, that's how we get rid of adapter diamond. So we preferably get rid of adapter, adapter diamond. Um, that around about 120 base pairs if you use full length adapters. And so, you know, a 1x cleanup, for instance, after library, um, uh, after library amplification where, you know, you, you have a bit of salt in the buffer but not a lot of pig or anything else, um, and DNA acts more or less like it's in, just in a weekly buffered solution. With a 1x cleanup, we'll be binding you know, everything bigger than adapter dimer and wash the adapter dimer away. Um, at the end of the ligation reaction, it changes completely. So here we have a lot of peg in the buffer already, and you can see how it affects the DNA binding. <clears throat> so when we do a 1x cleanup at the end of ligation, um, we're going to be retaining a lot of the adapter dimer. And this is just why in a lot of protocols, um, we have to do two cleanups. So the first 1x cleanup essentially just changes um, the DNA from being in ligation buffer to being in thrust buffer and then does the, the proper exclusion of adapter dimer um, after the second cleanup. Now with the with the kappa hyperprep chemistry that the concentrations are different, the concentration of pig solutions different, but also the amount of adapter dimer is so much less that we can get away 
and we actually do a, a, a point 8x cleanup, so, so roundabout there to efficiently exclude um, adapter dimer after the ligation reaction. Um, so as we said before, it may be required for some applications, um, usually performed with beads or electrophoretic device, but remember you're going to lose 60 to 95 percent of your library molecules. So that should really be taken into account. So for, for de novo sequencing applications, definitely worth it, but remember you're not going to be able to make good de novo libraries from really low input amounts. So for those kind of applications, you need, you, you're going to need to start library construction with a lot of DNA because you're going to you can throw up to 95 percent of it away along the, uh, uh, along the way. Um, for instance, if you're sharing your DNA to around about you know 250 base pairs, <coughs> after you add adapters, you're going to have a you know a mode fragment size of around 370, 400 base pairs. And the question is, do I really have to cut away the molecules bigger than 500 base pairs? There's very few, very little of them at that point. Um, is it really necessary to you know throw a very small population of molecules away? at the risk of losing 95% of the unique molecules in there, and the, the ones that can perfectly, you know, are perfectly sequenceable. Um, and so whenever you're designing a protocol, you know, whether or not you do size selection depends on the application um, and, and your input and, your, and how precious your sample is. Um, normally if we do size selection, we do it after ligation. I mean the principle here is you don't want to put anything in your library amplification reaction that you, you're not interested in sequencing. Um, because you know that will use up, it will just make you do unnecessary cycles of PCR and, and it uses up primer during the amplification reaction makes it less efficient. So if you have you know high enough input into library construction um, and a pretty efficient process that's still the best way to do um, size selection. If you have really really low input, in other words you know your number of unique molecules is limited to start off with, the best place to do library construction may be after library amplification because remember up to the end of ligation you have unique molecules, at the end of amplification you have duplicated molecules. And then that's the place where you can get rid of some of them and statistically hopefully you keep an even representation of everything. Um, point is, depending on your workflow, your sample type and what you want to achieve, um, whether or not to do size selection and when to do it in the workflow is something that you should determine you know, before you start processing a whole lot of samples with your given workflow. I wanted to explain dual spy size, um, uh, spry size selection. Um, because this is something that, you know, as sequencing read lengths are getting longer and longer, it's hard to shear fragment DNA to a large average size and get a small peak. In fact, you can't do it. If you if you fragment DNA to an average size of 200 base pairs, you can get a nice, you know, a nice tight peak, whether you do it with Covaris or whether you do it with Kappa's fragmentation, uh, enzymatic fragmentation solution. But as you increase the average size of the DNA, the peak gets broader and broader. And so, for longer sequencing read lengths, and especially, as I said, de novo applications, size selection does become um, necessary um, in order to make the, the sequence analysis uh, facilitate that process. <clears throat> and so many of you may end up having to do dual sprite size selection, and it's a little bit of a, of a black box, and so I wanted to explain exactly how it works. And so what we talk about in the, in the dual sprite size selection, or the double-sided spry, um, there's two cuts, essentially. And so <clears throat> what we typically would start um, with is you know adapter ligated DNA. Um, after you've cleaned it up, so you're going to do your, your your ligation reaction with hyperprep will end up being 110 microliters because it's additive. Um, you're going to do a spry cleanup at that point and then you know reduce it to elute the DNA in 50 microliters. So this standard our standard protocol um, describes a 0 0.6, 0 0.8 size cut, and that's 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 kind of designed to give you a size selection of molecules, sort of retain molecules between 250 and 450 base pairs, so with an average around 350, 370. Um, you can move that, um, so it's, it's possible to tune the size selection to retain a larger or a smaller population, but I'll just use this as, as the example. So in the first cut, you, which is a 0.6 ratio, um, it means you're going to add 30 microliters of ampere to your 50 microliters of DNA, so this gives you the 0.6 ratio. And what will happen there is that everything bigger than 450, so every all the big stuff that you want to exclude is going to bind to the beads at this point. Okay? You then pull down the beads on a magnet so that the, 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 the beads that are you know, now sitting in the bottom of the tube, the magnet holds in there, they have all the big stuff on it. <clears throat> you're interested in everything smaller than that. You want to keep everything smaller. And so you're going to transfer the supernatant and throw the beads away, like you're done with them now. They contain the big stuff, you don't want that. So you transfer the supernatant to a fresh tube, and you know this is 50 microliters plus 30, so you have about 80 microliters at this point. 
And so we'll go on to around 75 microliters. You can get a little bit more out of it, but typically we leave about five microliters behind just to make it pretty robust. Then you're going to add two more volumes of, of um, ampere beads. And this is where it kind of gets confusing. Because this ratio, the 2x, the 2x, the volume that determines that 2x is not relative to the supernatant you've transferred. It's relative to the original volume of the DNA. And so when people read our TDS, they phone us and say, hey, there's a, you know, there's a mistake. That, that 0.2x you know, isn't 10 microliters. It should be more. But it's relative because of, it, it's about the pink sodium chloride solution. Um, and you, you're adding pink sodium chloride here. The supernatant already contains the concentration of pink sodium chloride you added in the beginning. And so to maintain, to, to add another 2x, you need to, th that volume is relative to the original volume of the DNA, not to the volume of the supernatant. So it doesn't matter if you transfer 75 or 77, it doesn't matter at that, that point. Just recover as much as you can. Um, then with the, with the additional amount of pink sodium chloride, so you've now increased the concentration, it's going to bind everything bigger than 250 to the beads. So in this case, with the second cut, what you want to keep is bound to the beads. With the first cut, what you want to throw away is bound to the beads. With the second um, cut, what you want to keep is bound to the beads. This allows you to wash away all the small stuff, and then you elute. So the, the bit between 250 and 450 is then. So what, whatever was retained after the first cut and retained after the second cut, that's what you end up with. It's a little bit abstract, but at least you kind of you know understand how the process works now. And then if you want to retain, you know, if you if you want to shift the whole population to the right, so if you want to, for instance, retain molecules between 350 and 700 base pairs, you'll decrease. Um, so you'll do like a 0.4 or a 0.5x for the first cut. So the larger you want to go, make the, the ratio for the first cut smaller. Um, the difference between the two, always 0.2. Um, if you use less than 0.2, I mean, it's very little beads that you add at this point. I mean, you've thrown all the beads away because it contains the stuff you don't want. So it's a very small volume of beads that you're adding, and it's um, and so if you add any less, you just your recovery is so low that it's basically non-existent. If you add more, so if you make the, the size between the first and the second cut broader, um, you get you recover more of your DNA, so your losses are less, but your peak also gets broader and broader, and eventually you're not really size selecting at all. So the rule of thumb is um, that the first cut is the one that, the, the, that depends where your, your average size distribution is going to end. Lower cut for larger molecules, higher cut for smaller molecules, and the difference between the two always use 0.2. Okay, this brings us to library amplification, and that's the last um, that's the last um, parameter that we want to optimize. Um, and so, as we discussed before, um, library amplification is needed really for two things: to complete your adapter if all the functional elements isn't there, um, to make more DNA for the next step. And then one thing that we haven't really talked about is to enrich for molecules. So after ligation, you're always going to have a population of molecules that have adapters and that doesn't have adapters. And every cycle of PCR that you do enriches for the molecules with adapters. So it, it, it kind of, um, you know, the, 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 the percentage of that, that library um, population that ha doesn't have adapters, in other words, can't cluster and can't sequence, gets uh, relatively smaller and smaller with every cycle of, of amplification. Just to get you, give you an idea of sufficient material for the next step, so if you're going straight to sequencing, depending on how many, um, in, to what degree you're multiplexing, roughly, it depends a little on the size of the DNA and whatever, but you roughly need somewhere between a nanogram and a microgram, or a nanogram and 100 nanograms of each library for sequencing, if you're going directly to sequencing. If you're going to target capture with hybridization protocols, um, again, depending on whether you're doing a one capture per library or pooling multiple libraries into a capture, which you can do, um, you're needing somewhere between 100 nanograms and a microgram for every library. So the important thing to remember, <clears throat> for target capture, you're roughly going to need you know, at least 10 times more DNA than for direct sequencing. And so that impacts with how much you can start, whether or not you do size selection, because the aim always is to do as little library amplification as possible. Because even with good enzymes like the Kappa Hi-Fi enzyme, every cycle of lab library amplification does increase the risk of you know, introducing substitutions and all kinds of other artifacts. So whenever you do library amplification, if you have to do it for any of these above reasons, always use a high fidelity enzyme. Again, remember we're sequencing individual fragments, um, not populations of fragments. Um, and, and low bias is very, very important. Always do as little as possible library amplification. So if you only need a microgram of DNA, 
don't keep on going until you have five micrograms. All that you're going to do is create more duplicates, and duplicate reads in the end are going to get thrown out, and so you, you may reduce your sequence, your, 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 your coverage, and you're definitely reducing the evenness of your coverage the more PCR you do. Um, PCR also can make chimeric molecules, so these are kind of the molecules that it starts with the one end of one library fragment and so it ends with the, 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 the back end of another fragment. You can get this in you know populations of molecules that are very similar. And remember, you have multiple fragments covering the same you know piece of sequence, and so you know um, during PCR uh, fragments on you know the, the enzyme doesn't bind and make the DNA right to the end. It kind of binds, makes a little bit of DNA falls off, and it can very easily when you start getting overlapping sequence, you can very easily start with one molecule and end with another molecule. Um, you know, either from the same region or from a homologous region, and those are molecules that are bio like experimental artifacts, so they don't map back to the sequence and you lose them. Um, and so the more PCR, the more chimeras. Um, nucleotide, sorry, we're missing an E, substitution, so even though you're using high fidelity enzymes, um, they do make mistakes, and so the more PCR you do, the more substitutions you're building. It's not a big crisis for certain applications, but if you're looking for low levels, for instance, allele frequencies or, or, or on low levels of cell populations against normal backgrounds, cancer cells against normal backgrounds, it does matter. And then over amplification, and we'll talk about over amplification a little bit. Um, and you know, always make sure that your library amplification efficiency is, is optimal. And so you know, if you're thinking back to the beginning of this protocol, we said we're kind of separating fragmentation from the core library process from amplification. So it allows us to you know, optimize each one of those individually and assess the efficiency of each one of those individually. Um, library amplification is just a PCR. It's really easy to optimize. Um, and so, um, but it's important to understand how optimal your conditions are. And so I want to talk about a little bit about this, this, um, you know, this uh, phenomenon of over-amplification. And to do this, provide context for it, um, I want to step back and just look at the difference between library amplification and traditional PCR. So I referred to that a little earlier. Um, you're saying in traditional PCR, typically what we try to do is make a single fragment. So we're always targeting a single amplicon. And it's easy to optimize the conditions for that reaction. And so you know, typically what we would do there is you, know, you start with a, a complex molecule like you know, a human genome, lots of copies of a human genome. Um, and it, it will typically take you 30 or 40 cycles of PCR because you're amplifying very small bit of, you know, from a very large complex template. Um, and you go through these steps of you know, uh, uh, denaturation, annealing, and extension. And in a mobile PCR, um, the, the component that becomes limiting is normally the, the DNTP. So after like 30 cycles, depending on how the, how the, the, the maths work out, um, that's typically why you reach a plateau in, the, in, the, in a traditional PCR and where you're not, you know, not, no longer seeing exponential amplification. With library amplification, there's a, there's a number of differences. So firstly, your template is, instead of you know, having a few copies of a very large template, you're having hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of copies of very small templates. So for instance, if you have you know, 100 nanograms of human genomic DNA, you have 30,000 copies. If you have 100 nanograms of 300 base pair library fragments, you have millions of copies. Because you have millions of copies, you use a lot more primer in the first, in the very first step of the PCR. So when you denature these molecules, you're going to use a lot more primer. Um, you know, very quickly the primer runs out, um, and so you know what happens then when you sort of denature your molecule? Um, there's no primer to anneal. Um, let me flip to that one. There's no more primer to anneal, and so what you end up at the extension at the end of the extension reaction instead of having a double standard DNA molecule. You now have a bunch of single-stranded molecules, which have, have no complementary partner because there was no primer to prime the extension of a complement. And in biological PCR, that wouldn't be a crisis because if you're targeting a single amplicon, then there's a you know there's a molecule and its and its complement, and anything that is a single strand will just find its complement again, and everybody's happy. But in library amplification, because all these molecules are unique, or most of them are unique, I mean that's the whole point of, of the library construction process. Um, you now have a bunch of molecules that can't find, they'll statistically never find their, their partner again in this whole soup of library molecules. And so what they start doing is they start annealing to one another. I mean, the DNA wants to stick. Um, they don't, it, DNA doesn't like to be single standard. And so um, these library molecules, all they have in common are the adapter sequences. And so molecules that don't belong together will start sticking together you know, to one another by means of the adapter sequences. And they create these things that we call bubble molecules or tangled knots or heterodox duplexes of some sort. Um, 
and what happens is these are, I mean, these are, you know, end up being like big balls of, of DNA that's partially double stranded, partially single stranded. Um, and when you, you know, depending on the extent of amplification, if you keep on running out of primer, the more and more you run out of primer, the more you're going to create effect, this effect. And what happens is, you know, you're moving your library. So, so at the end of the PCR, if you go to a bioanalyzer um, with that analysis of the room temperature, that knotted stuff that was created during the PCR still exists. Um, and it now runs slower on a bioanalyzer because um, not only is it partially single-stranded, so it kind of gets trapped in the gel matrix, but it's also kind of big knots of, of, of DNA structures. And so you start getting this, sec that this higher molecular weight secondary peak. Um, and, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this. If you really overdo it, and we, we kind of use this example to, to really push, you'll see that you eventually change you know, from the, the, the library distribution that you expect to a much higher library distribution. The, the thing about these libraries is that, in, you know, to a mild extent, these library molecules, they're not really long molecules. You know, it's not like the PCR created a very long chimeric molecule. That happens, but to a, to, a, to a lower extent. These are just short molecules that are totally sequenceable that are just basically illegitimately annealed to one another at this point because of the fact that the primer ran out and then you, and you're now still working at the room temperature for the analysis. And so, you know, when you go to cluster amplification, um, these molecules come apart, they cluster perfectly, they sequence perfectly. When you go to hybridization, same thing, you know, they come apart and, you know, they can participate in the hybridization reaction. So over amplification is not a, it's not a huge big deal, apart from the fact that it's making your PCR less efficient, because if you run out of primer, you can't synthesize more DNA, you're just cycling through and creating a mess. And also it makes quantification really complicated. Um, and this is almost the, the bigger consequence of it, for, because for every step, whether you're going to cluster amplification, whether you're going to hybridization, those are steps that's important to know, you know, the actual concentration of your library, especially if you're going to pool, because you want to make sure that you're putting the same quantity of each library in that pool um, for the rest of the process. So it gets equal amount of probes and equal amount of sequencing rates. And so because these DNA is, is partly single-stranded and kind of knotted in weird molecular structures, it's really difficult to quantify. You can quantify very well with qPCR at this point because the qPCR basically denatures this mess and then counts molecules by synthesizing perfect complements. But if you're quantifying with any other method at this point, so qubit or electrophoretic method, any method that uses double-stranded DNA binding dyes, if you over-amplify your library, it is going to impact your quantification and it can impact everything else up to your eventual sequence quality. And so that's, that's why it's really important to um, optimize the, the, the PCR conditions very well. And also, um, what we'll come to later is just how do we measure it. And so, really important um, in, in library amplification, again, because we're doing very few cycles, uses a lot more primer. Um, your efficiency really is determined by your primer concentration. Don't worry about the DNTPs, they're not going to run out. The magnesium's not going to run out. It's really just the primers. And so, for, for library amplification, we use primers at a much higher concentration. The quality of your primers are important because that, you know, if, determines the effective concentration to make sure your primers aren't in water, um, that they don't degrade, um, and, and there's a few other things you can do to primers to really make sure that they're good quality. Um, and then library amplification efficiency, just keep in mind, can be lower for damaged DNA. So FFPE samples keep, you know, they have a bunch of oxidized and, and, and um, uh, deaminated bases. These things aren't copied, so this, this kind of damaged DNA doesn't get copied as well as high fidelity enzymes. Um, and also other things like cross-linking and so. So um, your, your expected library of, um, amplification efficiency is always going to be a little lower for damaged DNA than it is going to be for high quality DNA. Um, the, the CAFA libraries, so all our library um, preparation kits are um, now available with um, an optimized primer mix. So these are based on the Illumina, the P5 and P7 flow cell sequences, so the ones right at the end of the adapter. So it can only be used for libraries once they have a full length adapter sequence either ligated from the beginning or constituted by PCR. Um, and we've just formulated that to make it easier for you guys. Um, if you're using a kind of standard full-end adapter, then the primer mix is included in the kit. And we'll, it, it's just that the way it's formulated and the concentration ensures that you're not going to run out of primer and, and have the highest um, possible amplification efficiency. So <clears throat> how do I know? So, so we've talked about all these parameters. We've talked about different ways of making libraries. we talked about all the parameters that can be optimized, but how do you know <laughs> that you've done it as well as you possibly could? I mean, we obviously try to provide really good guidelines at the starting point, um, but how do you know? And so th this is where QC comes in. And so 
doing a little bit of QC, I mean, normally we'll do um, QC upfront and at the end, but doing a little bit of QC in the middle of the process um, really helps you with determining to say, hey, I've now optimized the protocol as well as I could. For, for these sort of samples that are representative of what I'm going to process in the end, it can't get any better. Um, it also helps you to benchmark things. So for instance, if you're trying comparing different kits with one another or different sample types with one, one another, that what can I realistically expect with this chemistry and this method for these kind of samples? And then for troubleshooting. I mean, even when you optimize things well, it, things will go wrong at some point. Your, your adapters will go off. Your primers will go off. Your beads will go off. <laughs> things will go off. And so even if you have a well-optimized method that works really well, things go wrong. Um, and it's kind of, it's very helpful to do some in-process in QC to help you identify where they went wrong. And so um, if we look at the, at the, at the, you know, at the, at the process again, here's your input DNA and your final library. In between, we have these three stages, fragmentation, the core library construction process, and library amplification. Um, most people quantify, so at least do some QC on input DNA. Um, it's important to know what you're starting with and what the quality is. Um, for, for quantification, most people are using Qbert or Pico Green. And then we have this qPCR-based kit that I referred to previously that help, gives you an idea of, of DNA quality. And that's only important for, for samples which the quality is expected to be low or variable, like FFPE. For good quality DNA, um, you know, high molecular weight DNA isolated from blood, it's not necessary to, to, to worry about this. And then everybody looks at the final library. So obviously, we need to you know, do some kind of electrophoretic analysis to see that the library is the size we expected. So if we fragmented the DNA to an average size of 300, and we add two adapters of 60 base pairs each, we need to see a library a shift you know, towards 350 or 360. <clears throat> and so electrophoretic analysis is important to confirm that the, you know, that the library is in the size range that you expect it to be. Um, but then we also need to quantify the library. <clears throat> You can quantify with, you know, qubit things with double standard DNA and binding dyes. Um, that's perfectly fine if your libraries are optimally amplified and aren't over, over amplified. Um, we very much recommend using our qPCR based library quantification kit. Um, it is more accurate, has a better dynamic range, um, but also, you know, does it is not affected by over amplification, um, and so gives you a better um, at, at all any stage of the process gives you a better. Um, uh, uh, quantification or better assessment of, of what the, 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 the um, concentration of utilizable molecules is at that point. Um, <clears> the <throat> sort of in-process QC that we really recommend people doing, um, especially when you're comparing kids optimizing protocols, is doing some, some um, quantification after ligation. So this is after the ligation cleanups, once you've you know, gotten rid of all the adapter, adapter dimer, all the ligation reagents, to do qPCR at that point. So remember your, 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 um, your molecules at this point will contain three populations. Some will have two adapters, some will have one adapter, some will have no adapters. Um, and also that the ends of the adapters of super single stranded. And that makes it really difficult to quantify with any other method other than qPCR. So qPCR at this point will only count the molecules that have two adapters, in other words, what's utilizable down, downstream. <clears throat> but it also isn't affected by the fact that you know, things are partially single stranded. Um, when you quantify at this point, it allows you to do two things. So it allows you to, to um, evaluate the, the success of the core library construction process. And we, we use this term conversion rate a lot, which is basically the percentage of input DNA that's converted to a data ligated library. Um, the efficiency of that, that process determines the, the, the uniqueness of the library, the diversity of the library, and ultimately you know, your, your, your sequencing depth that you can attain. Um, what it also helps with is when you measure at the point of, you know, at, after ligation, you know exactly how much molecules you have for library amplification. And so you can just use very simple um, exponential algorithms to say, if I put so much into library construction after five or six cycles, you know, I should get so much out. And it allows us to look at how efficient your library um, amplification reaction is. If you, you know, getting 50 or 40 percent of the molecules you're expecting at that point, it's an indication that you're running out of primer. Um, or that there's something else wrong with the reaction, and that you could reduce the number of cycles and do less amplification if you just optimize the conditions better. Um, and so conversion rates, I mean, we, we've characterized it very, very well for our kits. Um, you know, we, we use that as an indicator, you know, of the, of the efficiency of the core process. Um, and so I just put some tables here. Uh, this is our, our with speed, our conventional library preparation kit. This is the hyperprep kit, so our streamlined kit. And this is the hyperplus kit where we incorporate the enzymatic fragmentation. And so as we, as we you know, 
talked a lot about it, um, that ligation, the efficiency of ligation is input dependent. So, you know, from 100 nanograms and upward, you know, we can get, you know, up to 40 and 60, even 100 percent of library molecule input DNA converted to library molecules. So this drops as your input drops, um, you know, but if we look at the hyperplus protocol, you can see already like a tenfold increase um, at inputs lower than 10 nanograms compared to our conventional kit, which already a really, really well optimized kit. And then for FFPE, because it's damaged DNA, it's a little lower. But at least having these sort of, you know, guidelines when you, you know, when you process your samples for your specific applications, so you fragment to whatever size you need, you use the input that's available, you know, at least when you measure at the end of ligation, it allows you to say, hey, this thing is looking good, or you know, you could probably, I could probably get a little more, and so it is worthwhile to looking at, you know, to looking at things that, like adapter concentration, are my cleanups as efficient as possible, you know, is there anything else in the protocol that I, I need to optimize. And then just about, you know, um, predicting or, 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 or assessing library amplification, so we built this calculator, and we, you know, please contact our support team, we're happy to share this. Um, it just allows you, so if you have, you know, you know how much DNA you have, and, and the calculator has a bunch of, of parts up front of this one that, that, you know, helps you through the whole process. So you can kind of say, I have 100 nanograms of DNA, my conversion rate was 25%, um, which means I'm going to get, to it. I more or less have 25 nanograms of DNA available, um, but I eluted it in 25 microliters, and I'm only going to use 20 for the, for, for the library amplification reaction, so I, I'm only really doing 20, 20 nanograms of template in there. And then you can, you can, you know, play around with the theoretical efficiency to say, well, if my reaction is 80% efficient, which is a good ballpark, um, you know, if I need 100 nanograms of DNA, you know, for to go to get to direct sequencing, I only really need three cycles. If we need a microgram of DNA, I may need, I'm going to need around about seven cycles. And so we do provide guidelines in our protocols, um, but it also gives you a tool that if you're measuring what's really going on, then you can predict very well how many cycles of amplification you need to do. And again, the, the aim here to do as few as possible. And so this is the end of it. I know this has been a, a long session, but we do have a little bit of time for questions. Um, so uh, just to summarize uh, this whole part of the, of the seminar, um, we believe the best libraries are constructed with ligation-based um, library construction workflows. Um, if you combine this with non-biased enzymatic fragmentation or mechanical fragmentation and a non-biased amplification enzyme really gives you the option to um, you know, make the highest quality library from whatever input you have available. Um, you know, library construction or conversion rate depends a lot on, on sample type, um, your input, your quality, but it can be optimized. You can get the most that you possibly can by just tweaking a few parameters. And then finally, in-process QC, so doing essentially um, qPCR-based library construction, um, quantification after ligation really gives you a wonderful tool to tell you whether you are making the best possible library, whether your amplification um, is reduced to as little as possible, in other words, as efficient as possible. Um, and it's, it's a combination of those two things that gives you basically the best quality libraries, the deepest coverage, and the most uniform coverage. Um, and, and, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, just a final comment, once you have a well-optimized protocol, it isn't necessary to do the post-ligation qPCR. It just slows you down. But it's at least once you've categorized your workflow, you know it's optimal, you know, when it breaks you have tools to say, well, I know it was optimal from the beginning, so it's not a question of it should be optimized even further. It's breaking because, you know, something that was okay is, is, has gone off. Um, and it also gives you a tool to find out whether, you know, the, the problems up to the point of ligation or whether it's with an amplification reaction. Um, but it's not something that you would do consistently, you know, every time you make a library. Once you have your protocol in place and you know how to benchmark it, then you would just basically QC at the beginning and QC at the end. When all of that's within specifications, you just carry on happily, making the best possible libraries you can. <laughs>